All right, we'll officially kick off. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Fall 2021 QSI Colloquium Series. Uh, we're so excited to have you all here today. My name is Evan Moon, and I'm a, I'm a fellow at the QSI Institute. Now, before we begin, a few operational housekeeping notes. At the end of the session, we'll adjourn to a standard Zoom meeting for a remote cocktail slash coffee hour where you can chat more uh, informally with one another. And would also like to encourage any of you who are joining us today who are not officially members of our affiliate program or consortium to consider joining. Uh, the affiliate program is free to join. Uh, the consortium program is a paid membership program, although anyone wishing to join can apply for a scholarship if your budgets are tight. Uh, links to those on the screen and will be included in the chat um, after this introduction. Uh, also, we are also excited to introduce the inaugural Datathon for Justice hosted by QSide happening next weekend, pretty soon, on October 22nd to 24th. Uh, this year's theme is criminal justice, and we already have more than 200 participants from over 20 institutions of higher learning and mission-driven organizations. Now, today's colloquium is the third installment in the exciting program we have planned for the 2021 uh, to 2022 academic year. Our colloquium series features nine fantastic speakers who will discuss issues related to theory, activism, and technical tools uh, to shed light on a broad range of topics uh, related to inclusion, diversity, equity, and social justice, and much more. Uh, please visit our colloquium webpage and consider registering for and sharing info about the other talks we have planned with colleagues who may be interested. The link to our webpage is also coming up in our chat. And lastly, if you would like to support QSide in the production of more exciting research and activism initiatives, we would graciously appreciate any and all donations made to our organization, as it is your support that always keeps us going. Um, as we progress through our session today, we welcome questions for our speaker using the Q&A feature of the webinar, which you can find at the bottom of the Zoom menu. And please keep in mind that your questions will only be visible to the host and the speaker. So please don't be shy, and we'll have time at the end of the presentation for some answers. And finally, now it is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce today's speaker, Samuel Sinyangwe, founder of the Mapping Police Violence and Police Scorecard. So a little bit about the speaker, um, Samuel is a data scientist, policy analyst, and criminal justice advocate, advancing various data-driven solutions to end police violence in America. Uh, he had founded and co-founded many organizations to this aim, including the Mapping Police Violence, the Police Scorecard, and Campaign Zero, a national advocacy organization equipping activists with cutting-edge tools, research, and policy solutions to end police violence and their communities. And previously, Sam worked at PolicyLink, where he connected 61 federally funded communities uh, to research-based strategies to build cradle to career systems of support uh, for low-income families. He has also helped city leaders, youth activists, and community organizations uh, to develop citywide agendas to achieve quality education, health, and justice for young Black men. Uh, Samuel grew up in Orlando, Florida, and has been involved in community organizing and advocacy since he was in high school. He graduated from Stanford University in 2020, uh, 2012, where he studied how race and racism impact the United States uh, political system. Uh, through our talk today with Sam, we will explore how data is being used to develop and implement solutions that can effectively reduce police violence in America. So uh, that is it for me. And Samuel, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, as has been said, I'm Samson Yangwe. Uh, and I'm going to talk today about police violence and the data that has been collected on this issue, what we can learn from the data, and more importantly, how we can mobilize around data-driven solutions uh, to keep communities safe and to end police violence. Um, so, you know, my story goes all the way back uh, to 2014, uh, August 9th of 2014, uh, when Mike Brown Jr. was shot and killed by Ferguson police. Now, at that time, his death, you'll recall, sparked a nationwide protest movement. Um, and the implications of that movement, the learnings from that movement reverberate to this day. Um, but going all the way back to 2014, in the beginning, in the first days and weeks and months of this national conversation on racial injustice and police violence, 
there was very little data informing that conversation. Um, you'll recall that back then, initial reports started coming out showing that the federal government did not have comprehensive data on people who are killed by the police, let alone the number of people who are non-fatally harmed or injured by the police um, or otherwise impacted by policing across the country. The data simply, the federal government simply had ignored or was unwilling um, to do the work required to collect data um, from the nation's 18,000 different law enforcement agencies in a reliable and consistent way year over year. They'd simply failed to do that then. And even fast forward to today, they still don't have a comprehensive database of uh, deadly police use of force, let alone other types of use of force, even to this day. So we knew that we couldn't wait, um, can't wait on the federal government to, to collect and provide data. If we were waiting then, we'd still be waiting now. Um, and so you know, as a data scientist, I thought, what are some ways to actually collect this data um, and to track police violence across the country um, that doesn't require us to go through the federal government or to go through a loose confederation of 18,000 different law enforcement agencies? Uh, and so those initial conversations, connecting with organizers on the ground in Ferguson, connecting with data scientists, researchers across the country, um, better understanding the landscape of how incidents are reported, it turns out, um, that in almost every case where somebody is killed by the police, it's reported somewhere in local media. Could be on a, just an article online that you can search through a system of Google alerts um, tied to keywords like officer involved shooting, police shooting, et cetera. Um, it's also data that, that was contained in obituaries, in um, information that was being circulated on social media, that was being collected by local organizations, information that was collected at the state level in a handful of states that had begun to collect data on police use of force. Um, and But nobody had taken all of that data, um, data from law enforcement agencies, data from local media, data from obituaries, data from social media, data from other criminal justice databases, and pulled all of those together into a comprehensive set of information that we could then use to understand what was going on. And so that was the genesis of the Mapping Police Violence Project, all the way back near the end of 2014, beginning to literally document and find these records. Um, at the time, there were two existing data projects that had sought to do something like this. There's killedbypolice.net and fatalencounters.org. Um, both were independent projects. These were people who like woke up and were passionate about this issue and simply searched every single day um, for cases of people who had been killed by the police. So they'd have a system of keywords uh, and Google alerts. Um, whenever a article came up, they would simply log the link to the article, the date of the incident um, and the name of the person who was killed, if the name was available, um, and, it, and the race of the person, if race was available. Now, it turned out, you know, in 2014, there were just these spreadsheets that existed online, two spreadsheets, different types of information, both incomplete, uh, and huge gaps. So 40% of the records weren't coded by race. None of the records were coded for whether the person was allegedly armed or unarmed. Um, there was very little circum. Uh, uh, very little information on the situations uh, and the context behind each incident. Um, so this project was really focused on bringing together all of the existing databases and data sources that we could find on police violence, fatal police violence, putting it in one place, visualizing it, filling in those gaps through information obtained through public records requests and local media reports, et cetera, and then telling a story about police violence in this country that had not been told before at this scale. And so launched with this map, this map, um, I created, launched in the beginning of 2015, about March or April of 2015. Um, and this is a map of over a thousand people who were killed by the police uh, in, in 2014. And since then, um, have been updating this map every single year, all the way up to the present. And so this is what you find when you look at the data. Uh, so every single year, the Map and Police Violence Project has tracked over a thousand people who've been killed by the police nationwide. Um, and believe that that is a, about 90 to 95% of the total number of people killed by the police. So there are a variety of uh, research studies that have been conducted trying to estimate how many people are killed by the police, knowing that all of the existing data sets are incomplete. There are huge no notable gaps in places where you know, rural areas, uh, Native American reservations, places where it's less likely to be reported if somebody's killed by the police, it's less likely to be tracked or documented, places outside of sort of big cities that have these existing resources to track uh, the data. And so we know that there are gaps. We know that there are uh, disproportionately folks who are in rural areas, Native American reservations who are killed by the police, they're not tracked by any database. So part of this work is pulling together the data that you can find, but also understanding what's missing. Um, and so every single year we track over a thousand people killed by the police, but recognize that there are still more people who are killed that are not tracked by any database. 
Now, here's what that looks like in this year. So, so far this year, there've only been 10 days in which the police have not killed anyone. Um, on average, they kill about three people every single day. Um, and so you can see this calendar, it's fairly consistent day over day, week over week, month over month, year over year, the rate of fatal police violence in this country. So again, this is year over year, very similar year over year, you know, month over month, week over week, day over day. Now, that was big picture. We understand that there are about a thousand people killed by the police. We understand that this rate is consistent. It's not, this didn't start in 2014. It didn't start last year. Um, it didn't track with the national conversation as it's ebbed and flowed. This has been a consistent rate of police violence as far back as we have data, which is 2013. And what we also know is that that police violence is inequitable. Communities are disproportionately impacted by police violence, particularly black and brown communities. And so when we look at the data and we disaggregate that data by race, we find that black people are three times more likely to be killed by police than white people per population. Latinos are about 1.5 times more likely to be killed by police. Native Americans are between two and 3.5 times more likely to be killed by police depending on the year. Um, and also black and brown people are more likely to be unarmed when killed by the police as well. So the circumstances under which people are being killed by the police differ by race. And they also differ at the intersection of race and place. Um, so just like so many other uh, social indicators uh, in America, where you live and your race determines so much about your life chances. Our society is structured by race and racism and policing is no exception. And so when we disaggregate this data by race, we look at the disparities between black and white people killed by the police uh, in major cities. So we take the 50 largest cities in America. This is that chart. Um, you can see that in 47 of those 50 cities, black people are killed by police at higher rates per population than white people. And in the three cities in which that's not the case, Fresno, Wichita, and Mesa, Latinos are killed by police at higher rates than white people. So there is no, none of the 50 largest cities in America are a city in which white people are being killed by police at higher rates uh, than black and brown people. So this is clearly there is a difference in degree, right? So you have places where the disparity is you know, 1.5, two times disparity, going all the way up to Chicago and Minneapolis, which have the largest racial disparities and fatal police violence among major cities, 22 times disparity between black and white people. So that's the racial disparity. Who's impacted by this violence? We also have information now on what happens after somebody is killed by the police. What happens in terms of accountability? Are the officers held accountable? And by and large, the data shows that they are not held accountable in almost every case. In 98% of cases in which police kill people in America, no officers are charged with a crime. Uh, and even when officers are charged with a crime uh, and they are convicted of a crime, they're less likely to receive uh, a as harsh a sentence as a civilian convicted of the same crime. Um, so 98% of officers, no charges whatsoever. Um, an even smaller proportion, about 1% of officers um, are actually convicted of a crime, actually slightly smaller than 1%. Um, so fewer than one in every 100 cases in which somebody is killed by police, an officer is actually convicted of a crime. Um, and again, they get lesser sentences than civilians. So functionally, there's very little accountability for this, for this violence in terms of the criminal justice system. Now, that's sort of the landscape nationwide of police violence. And this is information that you, some of which you might've heard before because of so much reporting that's been done on this issue. Um, but what, we, what you might not have heard is how, this, how police violence breaks down in particular, in particular cities, particular contexts, and the policies and practices that reproduce that violence and those disparities in communities year over year over year. And we can track that too using the data. So, Disaggregating the data by place. Again, this is looking at state. We can see that there are, there's a lot of variation in terms of the rate of police violence, both overall and for black people in particular, depending on what state you're living in. Um, so you have states like New Mexico, Alaska, Oklahoma that have some of the highest rates of police violence in the country. But you also have states that have much lower rates of police violence, places like Iowa, New Hampshire, Illinois. Similarly, when we break this down by city, we see this, this variation. These are the 100 largest cities in America. You see that only one of the 100 largest cities between 2013 and 2020 had no killings by the police department compared to, you go all the way up to the other end of the spectrum on the left side, St. Louis, uh, Oklahoma City, Spokane, Phoenix have among the highest rates of fatal police violence in the entire country. Now, what does that mean? What do we mean? Like, how severe is that? Um, so in St. Louis, a black man is about twice as likely to be killed by a police officer as the average American is to be killed by anyone 
civilian or police, so twice as high as the U.S. murder rate. Um, in places like uh, Phoenix, for example, uh, in 2018, one in every five homicides committed in the city was committed by a police officer. I mean, Albuquerque, depending on the year, one in every three homicides committed by a police officer. So in, in some of these cities on the left side of the chart here, police are not only engaging in, in violence at a rate higher than other police departments, um, but indeed the rates are so high um, that civilians are experiencing violence by police at rates higher than the average civilians experiencing violence in general by anybody in society. Um, so so that is, um, that's what we see when we look at this chart. Now, this also helps us ask different types of questions. Um, so what is happening in places like Irving uh, and Lincoln and that, that is explaining lower rates of police violence relative to the national average compared to places that have much higher rates of police violence like St. Louis and Phoenix and Tulsa. And that helps us start to do a deeper dive into the explanatory factors, what explains police violence, what reproduces this violence year over year. Now, when we take a deeper dive in the data, we find that this chart is actually replicated within agencies, just as it's replicated across, just as you see these trends across agencies. So this is Columbus Police Department in Ohio. It's uh, one of the largest cities in the country. Um, and one of the only cities in which we get detailed officer level use of force data over a long period of time that actually has the officer's names and what happens when they use force. Are they disciplined or disciplined? So we can get access to all the data, the personnel files of the officers, disciplinary records, their names, how many times they use force, who they use force against. This is what that looks like for Columbus over, it's about a 20 year period. So what you see here, this is the left end of the, this is the high end of the spectrum in terms of use of force incidents per officer. Um, so there were officers in this, in this uh, police department that never used force. Their officers used force a handful of times. Most officers used force a handful of times. On this end of the spectrum, you see officers who've used force over a hundred times. Um, and you can see that there are a set, a set of officers who use force at dramatically higher rates than the average officer, just like there are police departments that kill people at much higher rates than the national average. Um, and what you also see here when this is coded, you can see the color code here, is that no discipline is represented by red. So cases where officers use force, receive zero discipline for it are in red. Cases in which they are reprimanded or counseled, so this is like a lesser discipline, are, are in gray. And serious discipline where they're actually charged or suspended or terminated are in blue. You can see here that almost none of the officers, even at the end of the spectrum in which they, the officers who use the most force in the department, even these officers, this is over the course of 20 years, most of these officers have never been suspended, have never been terminated, have never been charged. Most of them have never been reprimanded or counseled. And if they have been, it's only been once or twice um, over the course of their careers, despite engaging in police violence at extraordinary rates relative to the national average, relative to even the average within Columbus. Um, and so that's, that's what you can see here. Just as 98% of officers nationwide are never charged, in Columbus, 99% of officers are never disciplined for using force. Um, so there's functionally zero accountability, both in the criminal justice system in terms of officers getting charged, prosecuted, and in the administrative system, which is officers getting disciplined and fired by their employer, the city. Zero accountability. Um, so here is another visualization. This is police shootings that were officers who had previously shot somebody before. And again, at the top here is Columbus, Ohio. And you can see that a substantial portion of their police shootings are from officers who have a track record of previously shooting people. And it's not only Columbus, it's across the board. You see this, it's very common uh, among cities. Now, this is hard data to get because in many states, um, access to the names of the officers and their disciplinary records is prohibited to the public. It's kept secret by state law. Um, and so, you can only get data from a handful of departments like this, but where you do get the data, um, the pattern is clear. So that's the environment. We see from the macro all the way down to the micro, the within city level, you see many of these same dynamics, zero accountability, um, a, a high, high rates of police violence um, concentrated in particular places, particular units, particular divisions, particular neighborhoods, and particular officers with zero accountability and, and intervention to actually stop that pattern from reproducing. So how do we change it? That's the dynamic. What do we do about it? Well, first is in this work over the past six or seven years, um, not only in collecting the data and visualizing it and telling a story about it, but also advocating for solutions. 
you run into many of the same narratives, many of the same stories, many of the same arguments that often obstruct those changes from moving through. So what are those arguments like? These are things that you've probably heard before. So for example, um, in the gun violence space, right? In the gun violence, gun safety space, there are narratives, right? There's a narrative about a, the good guy with the gun. That's one of the key narratives. And this narrative we know is not evidence-based. Like we know the, the science, the data doesn't support the idea that like more people with guns are gonna keep us safe from the, the quote unquote bad guys with guns. We know that more guns equals more gun violence. You getting a gun could actually be a danger to yourself, right? Uh, having a gun in the household increases your own risk of being a victim of gun violence. Uh, but despite all that data, the good guy with the gun narrative has power and is extremely well known. It is a narrative that everybody in this country has heard. And it really actually obstructs progress. Like this narrative, this idea has the power to block any type of change having to do with addressing gun violence in this country. And it has, despite not being evidence-based. In the policing space, there are a similar set of narratives that operate in a similar way. So the narrative goes something like this, that the police are there to keep us safe. And that if the police are coming into a community and using deadly force, even in racially disparate ways, it's because they're encountering violent people in violent communities and are simply trying to keep themselves or community members safe. That's the narrative, right? That's the, the, the narrative. The idea that the police are here to keep us safe. They're only using force in response to resistance or threats. And so they're not doing anything wrong. It's the community member's fault for being killed. That's the narrative. So let's test the narrative, right? This is a narrative they've been using for generations. I mean, you could argue this narrative traces all the way back to slavery. Um, but this, these ideas about Black criminality, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we can actually test some of these narratives now that we have data. So this is uh, a chart of the 50 largest cities in America. These are the violent crime rates represented by the blue Xs. Um, and the police killings rates represented by the red square. So your risk of being killed by the police, your risk of being killed by community members. Um, you can see that it's all over the place, that there are places with extremely high rates of police violence and relatively low rates of violent crime. There are places that have high rates of violent crime that have relatively low rates of police violence. You have cities like Detroit um, that have you know, higher levels of violent crime, but are actually below the national average in terms of fatal police violence. And then you also have places, you know, I'm from a city, Orlando, Florida, second highest rate of police violence among the 100 largest cities in America. Orlando, Florida is not, you know, the highest rate of violent crime in the country. So something else is explaining why the police are being violent in some cities in similar circumstances and being less violent in other cities in those same circumstances. And it's not about the behavior of the civilians. Similarly, this is a chart of the cities with the highest levels of violent crime, community violence, according to UCR reports, um, in the entire country, among the 100 largest cities. And these are their rates of police violence. So again, huge variation. So you can be a high violent crime city and be like St. Louis, which has the highest rate of police violence in the country, or you could be a high violent crime city that has much lower rates of police violence, like Buffalo, uh, Nashville, et cetera. So again, there's variation. And this makes sense when we look at the data. It makes sense why rates of you know, violent crime aren't driving police violence, because it turns out that the vast majority of what police do and, and respond to doesn't involve violent, violent crime. So only 5% of all arrests made nationwide are in response to violent crime, according to the FBI's Uniform Crime Report data. Fewer than 5% of calls for service that police respond to are uh, involving violent crime, according to calls for service data published in the New York Times. So 5% of arrests are about violent crime. Even when we look at the most extreme form of police intervention, deadly force, killings by the police, the majority of those cases don't involve violent crime either. Um, the majority of cases in which people are killed by police nationwide involve cases that begin with traffic stops, mental health checks, domestic disturbances, or, or other reported low-level offenses. Um, so these circumstances, low-level offenses, nonviolent situations escalating to deadly force are actually the rule and not the exception. So that's one narrative. Now there's a flip side to this narrative. This is a narrative you might've heard more recently in response to data that has recently been released uh, by the FBI's Uniform Crime Report. 
So you may have, no, you may have noticed uh, headlines about crime going up and homicides increasing. Turns out crime actually went down in 2020. Uh, violent crime stayed pretty static. Homicides increased uh, 30%, which is an unprecedented increase. And so there's been a lot of trying to explain why uh, murders went up and trying to blame that in particular on the protests and on the pushback against police violence that we saw in 2020. And this is the same variant of the Ferguson effect conversation that we saw in 2015 and 16 and 17, um, you know, being pushed by the police and folks on the right wing trying to shut down any effort uh, to change policing in this country to say that that will actually lead to crime increasing and getting out of control if the police aren't there to aggressively suppress crime. That's the idea. This idea that violent policing is necessary to keep us safe. Well, again, these are theories. Um, and when we test these theories, they don't hold water. So this is, again, 2020 data just came out from the UCR a couple of weeks ago. Um, but we do have, long, have data going back quite a while on arrests and on police violence. Um, so going all the way back to 2013 through 2019, you do see shifts in policing, particularly in big cities. In big cities, you see a substantial reduction in low-level arrests. Arrests for, they tend to be misdemeanors, um, nonviolent offenses, um, things like drug possession, um, prostitution, drunkenness, disorderly conduct, um, vagrancy, vandalism. These tend to be crimes associated with poverty, homelessness, mental health issues, substance use, um, folks who are uh, in, in sex work, things that I would argue shouldn't be crimes, but nevertheless make up the majority of what the police are actually arresting people for across the country. And those arrests drop have declined dramatically since the start of the movement and the protests in 2014. Um, now, so there was a shift in big cities in particular, in rural areas, less of a shift. Um, fewer arrests we're seeing now. And in 2020, there's also a reduction in arrests as well. There was a pandemic, um, so that was expected. Now, what happened in places that reduced arrests for low-level offenses? So the theory would go, if the police pull back, stop arresting as many people for low-level offenses, the theory of the Ferguson effect and, and et cetera is that it will embolden criminals and lead crime to increase. Um, it turns out that the places that reduced low-level arrests the most actually decreased crime to a greater degree than the places that increased low-level arrests. They also decreased violent crime relative to the places that increased low-level arrests. And while both types of jurisdictions had increases in murder rates, because murder rates have increased across the board, uh, the increase in murder rates is actually larger in places where the police made more arrests, more low-level arrests, than the places where they actually pulled back and made fewer. And it, with police shootings, predictably, the places where the police pull back made fewer low-level arrests, stopped stopping people and arresting them and using force against them for you know, traffic, traffic violations and folks who are homeless and have nowhere to go and are being you know, stopped on the street. When the police pull back from those things, it reduces police shootings significantly. And in the places that police did not pull back from, when they continue to increase arrests, police shootings have continued to increase. So what we see here is actually that the strategy of reducing the size and scope of policing, the strategy, a decarceral approach that reduces the total number of people who are stopped and arrested and, and cycle through the carceral system, reduces the, the risk to civilians of being harmed by police use of force, in particular deadly force, and does not increase crime. So that's not what you would have thought with the narratives that you hear on Fox News. Now, those are the narratives, a lot of narrative change work that has to happen, pushing back against some of the white supremacist narratives, pro-carceral narratives that sustain the existing system. But there's also, a, in addition to moving the narratives, we've got to move the policies, the practices, and implement systemic changes as well. And so what does that look like? First, we go back to this chart on Columbus. So you may notice on the far left side of this chart, the bar called Purge IAB which is huge. So the charts cut off at 500. You can see this goes all the way up into the 3000s, over 3000 use of force cases in Columbus police departments uh, over the past 20 years that have no officer attributed to them, no name of an officer. Now, how does that happen? Well, it turns out that they were purged. IAB is the um, internal affairs. And they were purged because of the police union contract. 
So it turns out that when you do get some of the data, you can start to unpack how the systems are operating behind the scenes. And not only in Columbus, but all across the country, it turns out that cities have signed contracts with police unions um, that mandate that they actually erase the evidence of their officer's misconduct according to a predetermined schedule. So in some cities, it's every one year or two years, in some cities, five years, um, that complaints of police misconduct against officers are purged from their data. And so that means that you get a situation like this where they have, they know that there are these cases that exist, but all the information has been purged. So a huge proportion of what's happening in policing is not only kept secret from the public through state laws that make it difficult for us to get access to officer personnel files, disciplinary histories, but behind those, behind that curtain, they're actually systematically destroying the evidence as well. So this is one of the key data challenges is to not only work to advocate to change those state laws and to open up those records, but also to work to collect and preserve and maintain the evidence over time that's being systematically destroyed by these contracts uh, and records retention schedules. Which you also notice when you look at some of the data on discipline. So in Columbus, as I said, very few officers are ever disciplined. And when they're disciplined, it's light discipline. Um, extremely few officers are ever fired. But when officers are fired, it turns out that in many cities, a huge proportion, in some places, even the majority of those officers are reinstated plus back pay. So how does that happen? Well, it turns out that that is another provision in the police union contracts in these cities where police union contracts have a set of provisions in them that purge the, the information on police misconduct restrict the types of information you can even report an officer for misconduct based on. So if you're submitting an anonymous complaint, they will throw out that complaint in many cities because the contract mandates it. But even when you get those complaints, you get those records, you create a case, you have an, an oversight board that is effective and that enforces the discipline against those officers and they're fired. They get reinstated because of a rule in these contracts called arbitration. Now, arbitration sounds like this wonky legal term. It simply means that when an officer is disciplined or fired, the contract allows them to appeal that decision to an arbitrator. And that arbitrator, they get to pick, by the way. So both the city and the police union or the officer who's accused of misconduct get to just have to agree on who that arbitrator is, that here's the case. And they have full authority. It's just a, a lawyer who's picked by the agreement of these two people who has the full authority to reverse any disciplinary decision and reinstate an officer back on the force. And there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing the city can do about it. The mayor can't reverse that decision. The police chief can't reverse that decision. The community oversight board can't reverse that decision. It is a final and binding decision that in cities across the country results in a huge proportion of officers getting reinstated with no ability to do anything about that except by changing those contracts. So when we look at the research, we know that these contracts obstruct accountability to make it more difficult to expose officers for misconduct, let alone discipline them for it. They purge those records after they have been disciplined. And we also have seen recent research that has linked uh, police unions and police union contracts to higher rates of police violence, larger racial disparities, and an increase in misconduct overall in those jurisdictions. So we know this is a big part of the problem is that to change this system, police unions are perhaps the most powerful stakeholder obstructing any of those changes. They're also the ones pushing those narratives, by the way, that we went over earlier. So this all is, a, is an ecosystem. Um, but to dismantle that power, it requires a different approach. It requires engaging in the conversation about police union contracts. In your city, every four or five years, they will be renegotiating the police union contract. And so figure out what's in that contract and engage with your city council members and your mayor's office to make sure they're not approving or reauthorizing this contract for another five years that contains these types of problems that make it difficult to hold officers accountable. The other piece of this is that the police unions institutionally have used their power uh, to make it difficult to pass legislation um, that would open up some of these records or that would change you know, existing standards, policies, decertification laws, et cetera. Virtually any type of change is opposed by this, these police unions. So we have to address that power of the police unions directly um, by, for example, prohibiting police unions from having the power to negotiate over disciplinary matters. 
um, to negotiate over how officers are uh, investigated or punished for misconduct. All of that needs to happen. Um, DC, for example, last year signed a law that removes all of those issues from the purview of the police union contract negotiation. So there are no, the police unions no longer have the power to control or negotiate over or veto the path by which your city decides to hold police accountable. So that's a first step opening up a set of other changes that can happen down the road. Which reminds me that change is happening in some places. So you saw the data, it's not looking good. Year over year, virtually the same number of people are killed by police. Um, for every person that's killed by police, uh, research estimates suggest there are two people who are shot but survive by police. Um, and we also know in the data that Overall, the proportion of people who are killed by the police um, who are Black has stayed pretty constant. So the racial disparities haven't really changed either. But what has changed are a, a set of jurisdictions, states and cities, that have implemented some changes over the past several years. And we're starting to see the results of those changes now. So Austin, for example, we talked about the police union contract. Austin became one of the first cities to uh, where organizers effectively defeated a police union contract. This was back about three or four years ago. Um, Austin, working with uh, the Austin Justice Coalition, um, you know, I met with the Austin City Council members, the mayor's office, et cetera, um, brought in some of the research on police union contract provisions and how they impact accountability. The Austin Justice Coalition organized a whole, um, over 200 people to show out um, for the city council meeting where they were voting on that contract. And ultimately that, organizing efforts successfully resulted in a unanimous vote to reject the contract, um, which actually redistributed millions of dollars from the police back into the community um, and also eliminated some of the provisions that were obstructing accountability. Um, so local organizers have been effective in some places, in Austin, um, in Spokane, Washington, um, to effectively change the provisions in those contracts. Um, so you can go, for example, to nixthesix.org. You can see for hundreds and hundreds have coded over 800 contracts across the country, um, you know, issues in your particular contract in your city. Similarly, efforts to change state law in some places have been successful. Um, so in Maryland, for example, they repealed a police bill of rights law, which we talked about the contracts, the police bill of rights laws essentially take the problems in police union contracts and require every city in the state to have similar structural barriers to accountability. They scale those provisions and make them state law. And there are over 20 states that have uh, police bill of rights laws and Maryland last year became the first to repeal it. Now, what does that mean? It means they went from a system in which the police totally controlled the process by which they were investigated, they were disciplined, what happens when they're disciplined, they could appeal those decisions um, to trial, the, a trial board would decide on whether or not they would be disciplined, that trial board would be fellow officers of, the own, of their officers, so it'd be even worse than having the police chief decide it, um, and officers would not be held accountable under the status quo. That's now changed to where communities have a, a controlling interest, a majority stake, not only in decisions to investigate and formally charge officers for misconduct, but also on those trial boards and on the appeals process also have uh, play that role in majority stakeholder. Um, so this has gone from a police control process to a community led and controlled process um, because of that change in state law. Similarly, we've seen shifts that have built on some of the progress um, up to 2019 in reducing policing of low-level offenses um, and have scaled that to creating alternative approaches to some of those responses. So in Berkeley, they've begun to remove the police from the enforcement of traffic, uh, traffic violations, particularly equipment violations. In Virginia, they signed state law removing police um, from having the discretion to stop people for, you know, for example, having a broken taillight. Um, in Denver and in Portland um, and in Eugene, Oregon and in piloting in San Francisco and New York, they're starting to implement efforts to create an alternative approach to mental health crises um, where it's civilian responses, not police responses. And now the data is starting to come in from the pilots of those initiatives. And the data suggests that not only are civilians an effective response um, to these types of situations, uh, but also they respond in a way that is more cost effective and less likely to cause harm to the civilian um, than the police response would be. Um, and then you also see, you know, even the police are beginning to come around to this. In LA, for example, LA County, the Sheriff's Department issues annual reports on the efficacy of their mental health collaboration program, 
which is, you know, mental health providers take the lead in responding uh, to mental health crises and the sheriff's deputies sort of play back up and, and, and are on the scene, but don't really engage. And in that program, they, they issued a report where the police, the, the sheriff's department, the LA Sheriff's Department admits that they would have killed at least nine people in a single year, if not for mental health providers being on the scene to de-escalate the situation. And they also admit to hundreds of cases in which they would have used force, about 600 cases in a year, if not for the mental health providers being there to de-escalate the situation. So again, we're seeing some of these early initiatives creating alternative responses to particular situations um, that are largely successful, and even the police are beginning to admit that. We're also seeing how quickly change can happen in particular places. Um, so this is Philadelphia. Um, this is a week over a week chart um, where you see a dramatic reduction. So essentially what happened here is as the lockdowns were beginning, the city of Philadelphia, including the police commissioner, announced th that the police department was no longer going to be arresting people for low-level offenses. Mind you, low-level offenses make up between two-thirds and 80% of all arrests nationwide. And the police said because of COVID, because of the risk to civilians of you know, encountering people, arresting people, interacting with people over these low-level issues, that it didn't make sense for police to be doing that and they were going to stop, at least temporarily. And so almost overnight, low-level arrests in Philadelphia plummeted, like almost eliminated overnight arrests for low-level offenses. While maintaining arrests for other issues, violent crimes, et cetera, um, the police just turn the switch off. And so change can happen a lot quicker than they would have you believe. Now, again, they've started to reverse some of this. They still have much lower rates of arrest than they had pre-pandemic. Um, but this just shows how quickly, immediately, um, a policy decision can be implemented in the context of a major city police department. Similarly, we're seeing uh, results over time as data is coming in in terms of reducing police shootings um, and killings by the police. So in Oakland, for example, we've seen an over 90% reduction in police shootings um, since 2005. Uh, and this is, this is a huge change. Like if you were to, you know, you talk to city leaders, mayors, um, they would look at you like you were, you know, crazy if you said that we could reduce police shootings by 90% over, you know, five, 10 years in the city, they would say that you were crazy. And yet it's happening in some cities. Um, it's happening in places like Oakland. And these are the places that are implementing some of these solutions. They're the places that have implemented restrictions preventing officers from stopping and arresting people for these low level issues. They've implemented legalization of marijuana and frankly, the decriminalization of most drugs. Um, they've implemented changes that have uh, addressed dispar racial disparities in stop rates. Um, they've implemented changes that have begun to pilot alternative mental health provider responses to mental health crises. Um, they've dramatically restricted the standards that govern how and when police can use force. And they've created one of the most powerful community oversight structures in the entire country, one of only a handful that actually has the power to directly discipline and fire a police officer. So all of those things have happened in Oakland. They had a Department of Justice intervention um, that required a lot of these things to take place. The sum total of all of those things appears to have made a substantial difference in reducing police shootings in the city and making community members safer from police violence. So all of that's to say that change is possible, change is happening in some places, and we can use the data to find out where those changes are happening, to what extent, and what factors are successfully producing results for Black lives and for communities that we care about. So that's the, that's the, the approach. Um, and we're scaling that approach, right? So mapping police violence, um, you know, launched in 2015, uh, focused on killings by the police. We knew that was a huge, huge gap in the research. Um, and frankly, what community members had taken to the streets, um, protesting against people being killed by the police. Um, and now, obviously, there are we've been able to collect a host of other data over the past seven years. Um, and obviously, communities have sought much broader changes in policing, have sought to abolish the police entirely and create alternative approaches to deal with a lot of these issues. Um, and so how do we track all of that? How do we track progress towards abolition? How do we track progress towards public safety? How do we track progress towards the end of police violence? Those are the big picture questions and it goes beyond fatal police use of force. It goes into a more holistic and comprehensive analysis of how the police department and other agencies and systems are interacting with community members, um, holding them accountable to a set of common standards that actually center the communities most impacted, that center keeping people safe, um, that center accountability, that center justice and equity. Um, and we can do all of that through data. Um, and so the Police Scorecard Project is a project that, that I've launched um, 
few years ago, um, and now has scaled nationwide. Now, this is a, pro a project um, to collect all of the data that we can reasonably collect on the police, put it in one place, and put it in conversation so we can compare cities with one another. And more importantly, we can track the outcomes over time to see which cities are actually making progress towards ending police violence, increasing accountability, reducing the overall scope and scale of the police and the amount of funding for the police, um, and increasing the amount of equity um, that community members experience. So, so that is the, the big picture goal of the police scorecards, policescorecard.org. I encourage you to go to the website uh, to see your city. There's data for um, thousands of jurisdictions, over 13,000 police departments and 3,000 sheriff's departments. Almost every, I mean, virtually every city in the whole country is in this database. And we're continuing to collect more and more data through public records requests um, on the issues that we have, that there's no federal database on or state database on as well. So with that, um, just want to have one more slide and then we'll open this up for questions. Um, and this is again, sort of a, a slide about where this work is going. I mean, where sort of the field is going. Um, you may have heard of predictive policing and all of the problems with predictive policing, um, a huge issue reinforcing existing disparities and biases in policing, sending police to particular neighborhoods um, that that where the police already were disproportionately going to and, and, and harming community members in. Um, what is interesting, though, is now that we have all this data, we can begin flipping this whole thing on the police um, and actually beginning to use the data to predict police misconduct. And because it turns out, and researchers at the University of Chicago, along with the Invisible Institute, proved this in Chicago, uh, when you can get access to all the data, so they got access to, in Chicago, data um, ranging over 18 years, data on every police officer, every time they used they reported using force, every misconduct complaint report reported against them, every lawsuit against them, um, they had the names of the officers, the officers who were the witness officers on the scene, um, and they pulled all of that data together to create this model which actually can predict the spread of misconduct through the department. And what they're able to find is that not only are they those officers that I showed you earlier, like in Columbus, that are much more likely to use force against other people or shoot people or engage in misconduct, but those officers tend to spread those behaviors throughout the organization. That those that the officers who are put under the supervision of those more violent officers, the officers who are put under the um, on the same patrols and shifts as those officers, those who are uh, trained by those officers, those who are in proximity to those officers, then go on to exhibit similar behaviors down the road. They're five times more likely uh, to shoot people, four times more likely to use force, nine times more likely to be named in a misconduct complaint. So much so that now the science is getting to the place where we can begin to contact trace police violence like coronavirus. So essentially, if you're exposed to one of these officers that has a much higher rate of use of force, they can predict down the road that you will be more likely yourself to be quote unquote infected with police misconduct, the likelihood of engaging in these acts. Um, and that can be used to inform interventions, to inform efforts to remove those officers early from the force, um, et cetera. So there's a lot that you can do when you have the data. There are a lot of questions about how to use it effectively um, that I hope that we engage with. Um, but ultimately, I think that's where we're going, where the field is going with this. Um, now that so much data is beginning to become available um, that wasn't available before. So here are two resources to go to, mappingpoliceviolence.org, policescorecard.org. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, and that's all I got. Right. Um, wow. Thank you, Samuel, so much for that amazing talk. I, you know, I feel like at this point we shouldn't be surprised to hear about police violence, but I think that just the way you went through all the, especially through data and through narratives, the stark realities of police brutality, and I think also just showing pathways forward on how to move forward and how data can shed light forward. I think that's the hardest part, but um, I think I'll really hold this talk um, forward as I continue to live on this country. <laughs> um, so we have a couple of questions from the audience. Please be able to keep them coming forward through the q and function. Um, first, we have, and I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing folks' names wrongly, um, but I'll re just read the comments out loud. Um, Gary Nave, N-A-V-E Jr. says, all of this work is absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Um, there is, as you pointed out, a major lack of data on police violence and related topics. What data do you most wish we had access to? And what questions could we answer with that data? Um, and they're all saying, as I type this, you're maybe answering the question, but I'd still like your overall thoughts. Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, 
there's so many, the lack of data in general means that there are a lot of areas that we could use data effectively and wish we had the data. I think one uh, is the area of officer administrative accountability. Um, so, you know, when an officer is charged criminally, that information is relatively easier to find. You can find it through court case information or local media reports. Um, but when an officer is disciplined, is suspended, is fired, um, it's rarely reported in, in, in the public media. Um, and the only way to get access to that is to get access to the officer's personnel files or disciplinary records to public records requests to the agency itself, the, the police department. Um, and in the majority of states, that information is not considered public record, so they will deny your request. Um, so this is a huge, huge issue because, you know, as, as I showed, when you have that data, you can do a much more complex analysis of what's going on within the agency. Um, but that data is very hard to find. So uh, there are only 13 states that open up public records uh, for officer personnel files. So. Um, New York became the 13th state after they repealed 50A, uh, but only 13 states that actually you can get access to the office's full personnel file. Um, in the remainder of states, it's either partially or fully restricted uh, from public access. So I think that's one big area. Um, the other big area is information that the police don't collect. So again, all of these public records requests require you to obtain the data from the police department, which assumes that the police are tracking this information reliably themselves which we know uh, is a dubious proposition. Um, so to find cases that go unreported, uh, um, that is very, very difficult to do, but possible. And there's some ways that you can use data creatively to do that. So for example, uh, I partnered with an organization in Oakland called Rahim um, that what we basically did was we got access to arrest records. So we got access to the information on everybody who'd been arrested over the past, let's say five years in a given city. And when you have those records, you actually can then through digital ads and through other methods, reach out to the people who've recently been arrested to, to ask them if they've experienced police violence. And it turns out that there were a whole bunch of people who had experienced police violence, but had never reported it. Um, and so there are ways to take some of these databases that are often very problematic, right? So we're talking about databases that are tracking people, right? Tracking the names of people, where they're going, you know prison databases that are just designed to track and follow people all across the country and flipping that data to actually mobilize and organize the people who are being tracked so they can fight back. And I think that's a cool way of using data to sort of flip some of these destructive and, and, and biased algorithms on their head um, and use them for, ju for justice. I'm just going to break in for a quick second, Sam. I'm Chad Topaz. I'm co-founder of QSide with Jude. Thank you for that extremely inspirational answer. Also, I just wanted to like throw in that it really resonates because um, we are working on some issues of policing in our own small town and we've gone through the public uh, records requests and we're lucky that Massachusetts where we live is one of the states where uh, internal affairs documents are actually um, considered public evidence and even with that status of those records um it's been quite a public records battle with the state and with our local um police department so i in a way i in a way i feel worse knowing that it's a big problem but in a way i feel better knowing that we're not the only ones having that problem so thank you for that yeah thank you chad and samuel for sharing that i mean i live and work in new york and i know that any kind of police data or prosecution data has to go through like boiler requests and it takes forever to get here so um i definitely sympathize as well um i guess that we have a couple a uh, minute for like a couple more questions um uh let's see uh carrie diaz eden from the audience says uh, this is really interesting and they're asking if we are looking to do a data re-narrating work in our local communities, you know, where do we start? So I think, you know, start with identifying what are the key narratives that you want to challenge. Um, so whether it's on police violence or, you know, I mentioned gun violence, each of these issues has a core set of um, explanations that preserve the status quo. Things that the people who don't want to change anything have been saying and the people in those offices before that have been saying and before them. Um, and so part of it is figuring out what what are those narratives and then challenging them directly? I think there's a lot of, um, there are two different routes. This. I've seen people take different routes. So, you know, whatever you feel most comfortable with. There are people who just like, are like, okay, the narrative is racist. So we're not even going to touch it. We're just going to move past it because we don't engage with it. 
And then like, for me, I'm like, the narrative is racist. It's been around for a while. And until we like dismantle that narrative, it's still going to exist and have power and, and obstruct all everything we want to do. So part of it is like, okay, what's the narrative? And like, how do we challenge this? Um, and what you'll find is a lot of the narratives are not like based in science. There's not like a strong evidentiary basis for these narratives. Um, the narratives exist because of racism and because they they serve a purpose in preserving the status quo. So like the good guy with the gun analogy is a great example. Like everybody knows there's no science behind that, but it has power uh, and it exists certainly, right? And so I think that is um, that is the first place that I would start, figuring out those narratives and figuring out, can we actually collect data that hasn't been collected before? Can we put together analysis that can directly test these? Um, and also I think the other piece of this that's important to note is that a lot of this is subject to interpretation um, with data, as you know. Uh, and so I, I think the Ferguson effect is a, is a good example of this um, because researchers were looking at very different or at similar patterns and trends and coming to very different conclusions, really depending on like the bias of the researcher, right? And like where they come from, how they're looking at the numbers. What they were looking at was a increase in crime in some jurisdictions, particularly homicide, um, and they were seeing a decrease in, they were seeing that correlate with a either a protest event or a reduction in, in policing of like what they call, uh, what they call de-policing, which is a reduction in like arrests for low-level offenses, discretionary arrests. Um, and there are two explanations for what they were seeing. There's one explanation, which is that, you know, it, maybe it is that the, the police are pulling back and because they're pulling back, um, it's emboldening people to commit crimes and leading crime to increase. That's like the Ferguson effect idea. There's like a, a very, you can look at the same numbers and say, actually, you know what? It seems like the police may have traumatized a community. It seems like that police killing that sparked those protests actually substantially traumatized a community. And it turns out calls for service dropped dramatically. You see this after the police murdered George Floyd. Um, there was actually a previous study in Minneapolis that looked at a previous, uh, or actually this one was in Milwaukee, that looked at a previous uh, incident of police violence where calls for service dropped after that incident as well. Um, and what happened was the community was traumatized. They knew that you don't, you don't want to call the police when you're seeing the police being violent, like in your own community and all over TV and everywhere. So you're going to try to find alternative ways to resolve whatever disputes you're into, whatever situation you're in. Um, and some of those situations situations escalate in, in ways that are reflected in the violent crime numbers. So if you if you actually feel like somebody's trying to attack you, you feel like that if you call the police, they're going to come and also attack you, then you have to defend yourself by yourself or by calling somebody who you know can help you out. And that could be reflected in the violent crime numbers. So again, like you're seeing two similar, you're seeing the same data set, but the research you're looking at it could come to very different conclusions. And those conclusions matter. Because if your conclusion is that the police pulling back increases crime, then the solution that you're implying is more police, more aggressive policing, and don't let them reduce the number of low level arrests. Have them increase more arrests year over year, more people in jail. That's like the implication. If you're looking at it and you're saying, actually police violence causes a lot more harm, even beyond the individual who's harmed. It can harm entire communities, entire populations. It can traumatize and lead to mental health deterioration of entire populations, which by the way is true when you look at the research. Um, and that that trauma could actually have an impact on increasing crime rates. It could have an impact on making people feel less safe. That's like a very different thing. That actually means the implication is you need to stop police violence if you're serious about getting tough on crime. Like you're not gonna stop crime if you have the police sparking crime waves every few years. So very different, but literally like that is the conversation. And the problem is that the data is oftentimes not granular enough to parse between those things. Um, so a lot of this is is uh, difficult in that way, um, and you see, you know, how some of the existing narratives take on like a whole new form and and, and continue to reproduce themselves even in light of new data. Amen. Um, that is a really <laughs> amazingly insightful, and I think it's it's one some of the things that we at Q side struggle with because we're data nerds um, and we don't always that question that Carrie asked around like and then how do we sort of bridge that to activism, right? Like like not just sort of admire the elegance of our data. I think is a really important problem in that re-narrative thing that you were talking about. Um, just seems really compelling. So I'm, I've got a lot to think about. I know many of our members will too. Um, 
So uh, I want to put in one sort of minor um, bug in your ear, Sam, before we say goodbye for the day and adjourn to our um, other meeting. Um, we are going to be having our first datathon, um, which has really been a very popular program for us, and that's next weekend. Um, if there's ever an opportunity for the work that you're doing where you're collecting a lot of this data and you could just use some um, data science ho horsepower um, and just folks to help with different kinds of analysis, um, we should talk. Um, you know, we've we've got the we've got the math nerds um, who wanna who wanna crunch data for social justice. And so there might be some opportunities for us to think about ways that we can partner moving forward. So put in a little plug there um, for, for the work moving forward. Um, just on behalf of, of our community um, and all of us math nerds, um, we thank you very much for this just absolutely inspirational and amazing talk. Um, you know, the work is real. Um, thank you for all the work you've done and for spending a little bit of time with us today. Um, as you all know, um, now's the time when we switch over to a standard Zoom meeting and we get to video unmute ourselves and just talk about what we just saw. So if you have a few more minutes, um, Sam, you're also invited, but uh, you may be, have a rich and interesting life that has nothing to do with uh, our coffee hour, um, but you're welcome to join us. We'd love it if you would. And uh, anyone who can, um, I think Evan just popped the link. Uh, so we'll leave this going for about one more minute so get it while the getting's good grab the link and then we'll stop out of here and get that meeting started but um thank you so much um for for this wonderful talk sam thank you